seat. Uh, my name is Ricky, one of the pastors that serves here. So this might be a little bit of an odd transition, but um, you know, this is actually, we're going to watch a clip, and this is a commercial that I remember from my childhood. So uh, yeah, so go ahead and watch that. Sometimes I dream that he is me. Awesome, awesome. How many of you guys actually remember that commercial? All right, a few of you. This size is not as much. All right, well, you know, um, that's all right. But I remember watching this commercial as a kid, and it was, I mean, it was just like the commercial. You know, I wanted to be like Mike, like Michael Jordan, the best basketball player in the world, uh, best basketball, you know, in my mind ever. Sorry, LeBron, you're number two, but, you know, it's just Michael Jordan. And, uh, you know, I wanted to run like Mike. I wanted to shoot like Mike. Uh, you know, I wanted to jump high and, and fly like Mike. Uh, the, the only problem was I, wa- I wasn't really like Mike. You know, I, I really couldn't shoot that well. Um, hey, he's tall. I'm average height. Hey, he can run. I can, I can run slower. Um, he could jump, and I couldn't jump really high at all. And I think many times, you know, we, we think that, hey, for, you know, for me to be awesome, for me to be great, I had to be like Mike. I had to be like someone else. And I needed to, to kind of change who I am drastically. I, I was just nowhere near awesome enough. And I stayed, if I stayed that way, then I'm just not going to be that good. And I think we, you know, we all kind of think something like that. You know, it's those other people that are great. Those other people that are going to do great things, make huge impacts on others. We need to be, you know, when we feel like maybe we need to be like them. It's the Michael Jordans, it's the Steve Jobs, it's the guy that owns Amazon or some other big company, those celebrities. It's those people that do really big things. You know, for me, uh, you know, being a pastor, you know, I think like, man, hey, if I could be like, if I could just be like Timothy Keller, if I could just be like Matt Chandler, if I could just be like J.D. Greer, man, those guys are awesome. Man, if I could just be like them. And I think when it comes to not just kind of life in general that we feel that way, but I think when it comes to like, hey, what about God doing things? What about God doing something great, something significant? And I think that we feel very similar in ways. Man, if, if I could just be like that other person. Because that's the kind of person that God's going to do amazing things through. Not me, but somebody like them. If, if I could just be like that, if I could be more extroverted, if I could be a better talker, if I just knew my Bible like them, then God could use me in some big ways. If I, you know, if I was just better, if I was upgraded, hey, Ricky 1.0, I don't know if he's doing very much, but Ricky 2.0, Ricky 5.0, now we're talking but not much right now. You know, but is is that really how God works? Is God really just looking for the best and the brightest to do something through? And so, you know, today in Acts 8, we're going to be looking at, hey, what are the kinds of situations and kind of people that God actually uses? So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open up to Acts 8. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Uh, And then if you've gone to Romans, you've gone too far. So it is in the New Testament, pretty far to the back. Um, and, you know, as you're turning there, you know, in Acts 1, Jesus told his, his disciples, the apostles said, hey, um, you know, wait in Jerusalem, wait for the Spirit, and the Spirit is going to come upon you, and he's, you're going to receive power. 
from the Spirit, from me, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So they wait there, they, they receive the Spirit, and then Peter, he preaches this sermon. Thousands of people trust in Jesus, give their lives to Christ, and this new community is formed. And these, these people are living in community, they're, they're loving each other, they're sharing everything in, in common. They're having this amazing community. And then this lame beggar, he gets healed. And, and, and then the, the religious authorities, they don't really like what's going on. They don't really like God at work, not like this. Um, and so they throw Peter and John into prison. They, they question them. They have the, they're beaten. And then even after they are released from prison, the, the church says, hey, let's actually pray for that we would be more bold so that we could be more bold in, in sharing Christ. And, and then they're arrested again. And then, you know, later on there, there's a situation of Ananias and Sapphira. They lie to the spirit, and, and then they just drop dead in front of everybody. That's like, admit, that's pretty weird. Uh, that would really freak me out if that happened. Uh, you know, uh, that would just be crazy. Um, you know, hey, how can I pray for you? Oh, nothing. Life's great. Oh, well, they're dead. Uh, that would be, that'd, that'd be weird. You know, so, the, so and, but then there's this, this increasing opposition towards the church. And then, it, you know, in, in chapter 7, there's this man named Stephen full of wisdom, full of joy, full of the Spirit, and they, they question him, and then at the end of it, they, they stone him to death. And then there's this guy named Saul, maybe you know him better as, as Paul, that's his Greek name, Paul, and he's there giving approval as Stephen is killed. And then this is what we see in Acts 8. And Saul, again, you might know him as Paul, approved of his, Stephen's execution and there on that day, a great persecution rose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen uh, and, and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Let's even look at verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And so... Um, you know, one thing that we just see here is, is that that following Jesus can cost you. I mean, think about it. You know, they're being persecuted for following Jesus. And, and it's, been, it's been growing. It's been building. Now, this whole time, the church could have just been like, hey, tensions are rising. Things are getting kind of crazy. Let's just take a break. Why don't we just kind of cool down? But, but you know, they, they didn't. You know, they could have just said, hey, why don't we just only be nice people? We could just be really nice. We don't need to preach Christ, and we'll just kind of let this thing go. But no, they just kept preaching the good news of Jesus. And this is just a reminder for us that, that following Jesus can just lead to us, can lead to a cost. It can lead to suffering. You know, it, it, following Jesus can, can cost you your safety, can cost you your comfort. It can cost you your livelihood. You know, but a question to ask yourself is, how will you respond when following Jesus becomes uncomfortable? How will you respond when following Jesus becomes uncomfortable? I think right now, where we're at in this world, it's a great time to ask that question. You know, what, what are you going to let dictate your life? What are you going to let really influence you to making all the decisions that you make? Are you going to let your comfort Dictate what the choices you make. You're going to let your safety dictate your life. You know, hey, because you want to so protect your comfort, your safety, that hey, you're, it's okay if you don't really pursue Jesus or follow him or pursue living in community with God's people. I mean, again, here in Acts, they could have backed off. You know, hey, we don't really need to be, we don't need to lean into community. We could just kind of chill out. They could have distanced themselves from one another not associated each other so that they didn't have to be persecuted. But they say, no, we're going to continue to pursue living in community with one another and continue to share Christ. And because of that, this persecution raised up, they, they stone Stephen and this, this persecution raises up against the church. But I want you to notice what happens because of the persecution. And, on, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church and they were all scattered all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Verse 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So here's the, the first way that we see that God works, and it's this, God uses bad circumstances. God uses bad circumstances. Because of this persecution that's happening, 
Because people are being dragged off from their homes. You know, somebody was being stoned to death. The, the church, the people, they leave Jerusalem and they're preaching the word. They're sharing Christ as they go. The good news of Jesus spreading. In Acts 1.8, Jesus, when he's talking to the, the disciples, he says, hey, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And up until this point, the church had only been there in Jerusalem. They hadn't left. They hadn't carried out what, God, what Jesus commanded them to do and promised would happen. And so right now, because, because of persecution that's actually going on, it's actually fulfilling the command and promise of Jesus. That, that, it, would, that it would be going out, that, the, that they would be as witnesses to, to other areas. And it's not just the scattering of people, but it's scattering of a purpose, scattering of a, of a good news being spoken about Him. And so persecution had forced these believers out of their homes. But with them went the gospel. You know, and sometimes for us today, I mean, not all the time, but sometimes we have to become uncomfortable before we'll move. You know, we, 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 may, we, may, we probably don't want to experience that thing, but sometimes we just need this discomfort, and it might actually be the best thing for us because God could be working through that working through our discomfort, working through our pain. And I'm sure they didn't want this persecution, but God used it to launch them into something new, something great. And what was meant to, to stop the church became something that God used to further the church. And so we, 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 God uses these bad circumstances, and we see this really just throughout the Bible in Genesis. Joseph you know, he, he, he shares this dream with his brothers and, and his brothers take him, they throw him in a pit and then they sell him into to slavery, into servitude. He goes to work uh, for, for another guy, for captain of the guard. And then his wife wrongly accuses Joseph of doing something that he didn't do. And then Joseph is thrown into prison and he spends years in prison. Even one guy says, yep, I'll, I'll help you get out because you helped me. But it doesn't happen right away. And, but eventually he gets out excuse me, out of jail, out of prison, becomes the Pharaoh's right-hand guy, and then God uses Joseph to save thousands of people. And then later on, he's, he meets his brothers, he's kind of reunited with them, and he says, well, what you meant for evil, hey, you guys did these evil actions, it was evil, it was bad, but what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And so, you know, God uses the, these bad circumstances for, for, for good. We were talking about this at my city group this, this week. And people are sharing, you know, hey, what, what's a tough situation that you've been in or are in that God has used? And people have mentioned some really hard things. I mean, people mentioned death, hopelessness, despair, tough transitions in life. I mean, for Christy and I, we, um, you know, we, we have some unique situations in our, in our family and some tough, tough challenges as parents. Um, and there were some years in there where, I mean, it was hard. I mean, I, I remember just thinking to God, like, God, I, I don't know how much more of this I can take. If, if this keeps going on, I, I just don't even know what I, I, I don't know. And it, and it was really hard. I mean, and it, it still is in some ways. I mean, many ways. It, it's better, but it, it's still, still hard. And, and it's not like I'm saying like, but I, hey, I love my circumstances. But I would say this, that God has used that in some beautiful ways. I know the love of God in different ways than I, if that would have never been a reality. I mean, and it, like, think about that. I know that sounds kind of churchy, but like, think about that. I know the love of God and God has revealed his love to me in some different ways that I'm just saying I wouldn't have known if I hadn't have gone through that. I mean, that's awesome. The love of God. God, God has opened up some, some conversations that we've been able to have with different people that, that we can relate to, that we could just kind of empathize with that we wouldn't have had if, if we wouldn't have had this thing. And, and it's still hard. There's still tension. There's still worry. I mean, right now we're all in one situation that just stinks. I mean, COVID, let's just admit. I mean, I don't know if anybody's like, man, this shit, you know what? This is kind of cool. Right? It's not. 
But God can use this. He can use, I, I think in some ways, He can use it to help us just slow down. Hey, you're running. You're going everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Hey, just slow down. Spend some time with the people that you need to spend time with. Hey, spend some, hey, just slow down and just spend some time with me. Spend some time with Jesus. I mean, I, I think in some way, you know, and hopefully this is a time where it actually helps us to lean into community. I know that, you know, hey, distancing ourselves and everything like that, and I, you know, I get that, but in another sense, it's like hopefully God uses this to help us realize, wait a minute, I need community more than ever. I need relationship more than ever because, man, I can't do this alone. Not to lean out of community, but to lean into it. You know, and God can use this. You know, for you, what is a situation either right now or in your past that God is wanting to use? I mean, think about that. What is something that has happened in your past? And yes, it stinks, it's not fun, but that God can use. That bad circumstance, that crummy situation. And, and let me ask you, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that God can use that crummy circumstance for your good and the good of others? I mean, and I know some of you are thinking, you know what, I don't even really care if God uses something for good. You don't know my circumstance, Ricky. This is so hard. This is so awful. And I, I, I don't really care if God uses it. I just want him to fix it. I just want him to change it because it stinks. What is God going to do about that? And, and, I, and I get it. I mean, the, I, the, the, I'm sure that that situation that you're in is really hard. Again, here in Acts, I mean, this, this is a tough circumstance. We could just kind of gloss over and be like, oh, hey, persecution arose. But I mean, think about this. Stephen, a guy that they loved, that they knew, just died. I mean, I've never been somebody seen somebody stoned old school style like that. But I'm guessing that's awful just watching somebody get pelted with rocks that way. People being dragged out of their homes, torn away from their families, being thrown in jail, being murdered. That's bad. It's really hard. And, and you know, there's this thing of like, God, what are you going to do about that situation? Why aren't you doing something? Why isn't God doing something in your life with, with whatever circumstance you're, you're facing? And I just say, I don't know. I mean, I, I wish I did. I don't, I don't know why, you know, what will happen if he'll take it away, if he'll fix it. But I would just say this. We do have a hope. Maybe that he won't exactly just fix your circumstance right now, but with whatever's going on in your life and definitely what we see just going around in the world to us, we have a hope that one day Jesus is coming back and he will fix everything. One day everything will be made new. Everything will be put to right. One day there will be no more cancer. There will be no more tears. There will be no more pain because Jesus came and said that's enough and I am just restoring everything. And it might stink waiting for that to happen, but we have a hope in Jesus. And if, we think, if I think of maybe the worst circumstance ever, ever, I think of a completely innocent man that was betrayed by a, by a friend, by a close friend that was put on trial unjustly, that was mocked and was crucified. And while being completely innocent, he paid the price for those that are completely guilty. And that is what happened to Jesus when the Son of God was murdered by the very people that he came to save. And he came to save the guilty and the, the guilty, not just Bar Barabbas, you know, in the Bible, but us, we go free while Jesus paid it all. He was put to death so that we can have life. He was cursed so that we could get the blessing. And he was condemned so that we could be made right with God. And, and, if, and if God could use a circumstance like that, a crummy situation like that, to, to bring you and me new life, forgiveness of sin, relationship with God, if He can use that to bring us that, then certainly He can use whatever is in your life for His good. 
for your good. And we don't look to God just because He's going to make our bad situations good. We look to God because He is good. He is our hope. We're trusting in Him. And so we see, you know, from this this great persecution that's happening, the church scatters. And we see that God is using this bad situation. But then notice notice what else God uses. Verse 1. And there arose in that great day a great persecution against the church, in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. So who's they there? You know, it says they were scattered. Just the church. Just people. They're the ones that are leaving Jerusalem. The the apostles, they're staying there. And so when Jesus says, hey, you'll be my witnesses in Acts 1-8, you'll be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, who's actually carrying that out? Just the church. Just regular people. It's not the apostles. It's not the pastors. It's just ordinary people, ordinary followers of Christ. And so that's the second thing. God uses ordinary people. Ordinary people. These are, these are not people that went to seminary. These are not professionally trained evangelists. These are not the pastors. Again, these are laymen and women. It's the engineers. It's the teachers. It's the stay-at-home parents, the chiropractors, the salesmen, the ordinary people that God is using here. And so the main agents, that, that, that the, the good news of Jesus is going out is not by those who made it a profession. But just men and women who carried on just their, their, their lives, their livelihood, and just shared those the, that were around them about what Jesus has done for them. It didn't depend on the apostles, but this grassroots movement of just men and women sharing Jesus as they went. You know, it's not, it's even, it's not about a select few people or even a select city. A lot of people thought, hey, God is in Jerusalem, the temple. That's where the center of his presence and his purpose and his power is. But actually we see, no, like as people are moving out on purpose, that's where God is. That's where God is moving. And these people that were refugees fleeing persecution, they didn't leave as refugees. They left as missionaries. God uses ordinary people and that's how he's, Carrying out the Great Commission. People, you know, and, and that again is going to be happening today through you going to your homes, going to your workplace, going to your neighborhoods, going overseas, going into different cities, being a light to the world in both word and deed. It's not about a superstar or the paid professionals. I mean, just think in the Bible. Throughout the Bible, who is God using? Who is God using? I mean, think Abraham. What's special about that guy? He's just a pagan when God inter- intervenes, when God comes. Joseph, or well, Jacob. Jacob's just a liar. Joseph, he's a guy that just can't keep his mouth shut about telling his brothers about his dream and he has a coat. Moses, he's an orphan. David, he's a shepherd. I mean, even, even if we think, who's done the most? Jesus, right? I mean, yes, he's God. He's fully God. But in his humanity, Jesus didn't come from a palace. Jesus didn't come from royalty or prestige. He came, he came amongst those who were being ruled over by others. His dad's a carpenter. He grew up in a small town that nobody even liked. Even other people said, what good can come from Nazareth? And, and even here in Acts, these so-called superstars, the apostles, think of who they are. I mean, most of them are fishermen. Peter, James, John, Andrew, they're fishermen. Matthew, he's a tax collector. Then there's Simon, the zealot. I don't even, I mean, I don't think that's even a job. I mean, they don't, they don't even know how to describe him. Like, well, I don't know, he's zealous. He's, he's there. But God filled them with his spirit. Hey, you're going to do something amazing because I'm giving you my spirit. I'm giving you my power. I'm giving you my presence and you're going to go out. And many times we think that we have to be like someone else. Hey, if I could be like Mike, if I could be like him, then I could be great. 
And many of you, you're thinking that, man, for God to do something substantial through you, you're like, well, man, if I could just be like them, if I could just know my Bible like them, if I could just be extroverted like them, if I could just be like that like them, if I could just, man, hey, if, if I just knew my Bible so much better, and if I could just have all the answers, because if somebody asks me a question that I don't know the answer to, if I could just know the answers, then God would use me. And, and sure, we do want to seek God in His Word. We do, you know, and wrestle with questions that we or others might have, but your limitations doesn't limit God. Your mundaneness doesn't make God any less mighty. You being ordinary doesn't make God any less extraordinary. I mean, in, script, in, in the early church, the three, three of the most influential churches were Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome. Paul, you know, Paul writes a letter to, you know, the book of Romans. And when he gets there, there's already a church. Paul didn't plant it. Who planted it? We don't even know. Just some guy, some lady, some couple. Maybe just business people that showed up there and just like, hey, we're going to preach Christ. That's how, it, how the church started there. And so here's a conviction that I want all of you to have. I want to have. And this is, the, this is this conviction. This is this truth. God wants to use me. God wants to use me. That is how we're going to be, see more disciples being made, more people coming to new, know Christ is through you. It's not going to be like, hey, we have some new cool sermon series. Hey, you know, hey, let's just get more kick butt music. And let's get a fog machine, and let's get some sweet lights. I mean, hey, you could kind of tell in here the lights are kind of goofy, and it's all shadowy. Hey, if we just got new lights, and, and you know, that would be awesome. If we just got all that stuff, then people would be like, whoa, whoa, man, they got, they got a fog machine, they got lights, man, I'm so interested in Jesus now. Right? That's not going to happen. It's going to be because, because you are going out being a light to the people around you. God, and and it, it's going to happen through you. And if you're thinking, no way, are you really talking about me? Yes, I actually mean you. You, the high schooler. You, the college student. You, the young adult. You, the married couple. You, the overly busy parent. You, the empty nester. God wants to use all of you. God filling ordinary people with his spirit. So it's you building a relationship with someone. You pointing them to Christ and what God has done to you. Do you believe that? I'm not saying, do you hear me saying it? I'm saying, do you believe that, that God wants to use you? The best ministry that happens through the church is Monday through Saturday, not Sunday. It will happen through you Monday through Saturday. And I, Guys, I believe this with my whole heart. I've seen God use you guys in, in, in amazing ways, but I believe this with everything in me that God is going to continue to use you in incredible ways. God is going to help, like, use you in incredible ways to help somebody that's lonely feel not alone anymore. Somebody that's in need, that's in a tough spot to see their needs met and to be cared for. Somebody that that just needs a friend to be, and for somebody to pray with them, that that'll happen through you. Somebody that really doesn't know of God's amazing, wonderful love for them, that you're going to be able to share that with them. I so believe that. And more importantly, I want to tell you, God believes that. In First Peter, you know, the Word says, you are my chosen people a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You're my treasured possession so that through you, you will declare the praises of him who saved you, who brought you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's what God says about you. He said, like, God believes that about you because that's who he's made you. And not just that, but he's like, but I've not just made you something different. I've given you something different, my spirit in you. I don't, I don't believe in you just because you're, you're incredible and I love you and all of those things, but I believe because God has made that true. 
His Spirit working through you. We don't have to be, we, we, don't, we don't have an ordinary God that only uses the extraordinary. We have an extraordinary God who uses the ordinary. And so God wants to use you, and we've seen God, how He uses bad circumstances and how He uses ordinary people. And last we see that God uses the least likely. He uses the least likely. Verse 1 says, Saul approved of, of his, meaning Stephen's, execution. Uh, you know, for some reason, I think of the movie, movie Dodgeball all the time when I read this. Um, you know, where he's, you know, they're asking, hey, can we play a game? And, you know, people are like, no, no. But then there's Chuck Norris, and he's giving his, his thumbs up of approval, and it's like, maybe that's what Saul's doing here. I don't know. But anyways, I think that he's just like, yes, approved, death. Um, so maybe that, you know, he's approving here. Uh, and then again, Saul, uh, you know, you'd probably recognize his name a little bit more as Paul. But, you know, he, he's, he's this devoted Jew. He thinks what he's doing is the right thing, that he's actually serving God, but he's totally mistaken. And in his reaction to these um, people that are, that are believing in Jesus, living in this community, his reaction to them is like, hey, let's just stomp that out. Let's persecute them. I'm going to drag them from their homes. I'm going to drag them from what they're doing. I'm going to put them to death. I'm going to put them in prison. He stops seeing them as real people. I mean, notice in verse 2, this contrast, devout men, and even where it says devout men, this is actually, uh, many commentaries say that this is actually people that weren't following Jesus. They were just Jews. But these devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. If you're publicly, publicly executed, they, they, you couldn't get, you wouldn't be grieved over publicly because of the shame that it would bring on you. And so these, these guys, they still see Stephen, even if they disagreed with him, as a person, as a human. But Paul, he just wants to make a point. Let's have a public execution so that we could, you know, publicly scare people and all of these things. And he's just, he's no longer thinking that they're people. I mean, and today, with all the various you know, just opinions, debates, arguments, you know, division that's going on. You know, like Elvin said a few weeks ago, just remember to keep the main thing the main thing. And Jesus is always the main thing. If somebody disagrees with you about something, like it's okay. Right? I mean, I know that sounds weird, but, it, but it'll be okay if they disagree with you. You, you have Christ. And, and whoever's on the other line of that, that, that post or that, that message or whatever it may be, there's still a person there that's made in the image of God. We should always be treating them that way, somebody that God created and loves. And so Saul, he just forgotten that. And so he just seeks to destroy this movement by destroying its people. But we see that God is using his, his sinful actions, his sinful heart in this. You know, he's trying to destroy the church, and hey, I'm just going to do all of this. But God uses that bad situation, those bad actions, to, to advance his church. And so we actually see here that God is using Saul, using the least likely. I mean, because let's, let's just think about it. At, you know, many times we could forget, we just think of who Paul became, and, and he definitely did. But, but who is Saul right now in the story? He's a murderer. Right? He's, a, he's a mean guy. I mean, this is not a guy that you're going to be, hey, what are you doing this weekend? You want to come over for the game? Come over to my house. Let's watch the game together. I mean, huh, what game? There is no game. You know, like that's not even happening. Like you don't want these, this guy hanging out with your kids. But a chapter later, Jesus reaches into Saul's life and saves him. And, and, he, and he, you know, again, we know him by Paul, but God uses him to share Jesus with thousands and thousands of people. And even, even a, a reason that why we're here today is probably because God used Paul or Saul, you know, in amazing ways to plant churches and to continue the mission of Christ. But he is the least likely person that you would expect to use. And so the story teaches us a couple of things teaches us a couple of convictions. 
The first is this. With God, there's no, not ever a lost cause. With God, no person is a lost cause. Don't ever give up on what God could be doing in someone's life. Don't ever give up on what God can be doing in someone's life. I mean, with Saul here, you, you would think, hey, the guy who's persecuting the followers of Jesus, you would think, hey, this is probably not a very likely person to actually become a follower of Jesus. But that's what happened. That person in your life that you think that wants nothing to do with God, and they might not want anything to do with God. I'm sure Saul at this point in the story wanted nothing to do with God. But know this, God wants something to do with them. Jesus wants something to do with them. He wants to save them. He wants them to know him, to know of his amazing, unconditional love for them. And so my encouragement to you, because you know, you're thinking of somebody, a relative, a friend, like, man, are, are they ever going to come to know him? Are they, you know, don't give up. Keep praying. Keep pursuing. Keep trusting Jesus. Keep sharing, loving them, sharing Jesus with them. With Jesus, there is no lost cause. And if you're thinking, hey, what about me? I think I'm a lost cause. There is no lost cause, even you. Whatever has happened in your past, there's no sin that is too big for Jesus. And I just want you to think, I mean, whatever it is that you're, you know, you've done in the past, think Saul here doesn't come to know God because he stopped persecuting people all of a sudden. Saul doesn't come to know Jesus because he, he got his act together, he got everything in order, and suddenly was really good. Saul came to know Jesus because he met Jesus. That's what changed him. Jesus came down and entered his life. And no, notice there, it's not because Saul was, a, again, a really good person or anything like that, because some of you that are even like are farther away from Jesus, you think that you're okay because you went to church growing up, or you got baptized, or you prayed a prayer once, any of thing. No, I'm not asking you, have you been to church, or are you a good person? You're not. This thing leads us to, have you met Jesus? Jesus. Do you know Christ? Because you can be saved regardless of whatever your past is, whether you think it's good or it's bad, you're only saved through Jesus. Trusting in Him that He paid the price for your sin, that He's the one that actually brings you out of your junk, out of your death, out of your separation from God and brings you to a relationship with himself. You're not a lost cause. And even if you're thinking, I don't know if I want anything to do with Jesus, Jesus wants everything to do with you. Turn to Christ. Have you met him? Second conviction, you know, we know that with God there's no lost cause. But second conviction is God can use whatever your past is and redeem it and make it beautiful. God can redeem your messed up past and life. Saul is proof that your story doesn't have to end with sin and shame or that bad situation, but what God can do. You know, some of you struggle to believe that God really wants to use you because you're thinking, well, I don't know if I know the right things. I don't know if I, you know, have what, what it takes. And some of you, that's not so much you. You're thinking, I don't know if God wants to use me. I don't really believe that because of me because of something that I've done or maybe something that has been done to me. You're thinking, I don't know if God could redeem that for his glory to use me. And hey, you're listening and you're like, well, hey, Ricky, that's, that's cool and that's maybe somebody else, but Ricky, you just don't really know what has happened in my life. And, and if I only told you or if I only told other people here, I, I couldn't because what you would reject me. You, would, you would, wouldn't want anything to do with me because of what I've done. I just want to tell you that's a lie. It, it, I mean, ha, have you ever systematically persecuted and murdered people? Right? I mean, that's actually kind of supposed to lighten the mood a little bit. 
Right? I mean, here, I mean, here's Paul, or, or you know, Saul, and I mean, you know, what's he doing? Well, uh, you know, hey, yeah, I was, uh, you know, I mean, like, has this been any of your story? What are you guys, what are you doing a couple years ago? Well, you know, I was just going door to door, and I was just dragging men and women out of there because they're following Jesus and being, you know, living in this cool community. I'm just dragging them out and throwing them in prison. I'm murdering them. And I'd be like, oh, hey, you know, so where are you at right now? You know, how's, that, how's life been lately? Right, I mean, is that, is that any of your story? I mean, I hope not. But I mean, like, again, that's a pretty messed up past. And if God could say, hey, yeah, you were doing all these things, but I have something different for you. I'm going to use this story for my glory. If he could do that in Saul's life, he could do that in your life. Your tragedy could become God's triumph. Your sin can be, and shame can become God's new story. Your brokenness is something that God could use in amazing, beautiful ways in the lives of others. I mean, there's something that we say around here. You can impress people with your strengths, but you connect with people through your weaknesses. And I know in South Lincoln especially, it seems like, oh, well, you look at anybody around you, and it seems like they have it all together. Well, I would share, but I'm the one that's messed up around here and everybody else has it great. I just want to tell you that's a mirage. Their life is not as good as you think. They have more brokenness than you definitely think. And if, they, if even by chance their life seems to be going pretty good, you just give it time and it'll, something will happen. Don't ever think that about me. I mean, like, we all have lies that we believe, insecurities, pain, strife, all of these things. But we connect with people not because we look awesome. The times where I felt most connected with people is because it's like, man, I'm actually just sharing, man, I'm, I'm really struggling here. Or somebody else just shares, hey, here's what's kind of going on in my life right now. We connect with people we walk alongside of each other in those moments because God can use like whatever messed up past thing that you have. And so, you know, just whatever bad circumstances you've experienced, whatever bad circumstances you're in, God can use that. God can use those. Whatever you think that you lack and you don't, you're not good enough, you don't, you're not smart enough, you don't know your Bible enough, you know, you're just kind of ordinary. God uses ordinary people. He wants to use you. And whatever your past sin or shame, God uses the least likely, uses the people that you would never expect, uses people with messed up pasts for His glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank You that, that You are good. We thank You, Lord, that, that You do work in amazing ways, God. Lord, um, I pray, Lord, that you just help us to believe, Lord, that you are, are near, that you're with us in these, in these situations in our life, Lord, and that you are working and that you want to use those, you want to use us. So, Lord, help us to believe those things and thank you, God, Lord, that our hope is in you, your goodness. Lord, and when we ever doubt your power, when we ever doubt your goodness, may we just look to the cross to know that, man, that was a terrible situation, but Jesus rose from the dead and gave us life, totally by your grace, totally by the gift of God. We ask this in your name. Amen.